It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things that we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Galatians 6 1. It might be a a short message uh, tonight. Or it might go on, I don't know. But we're going to finish Galatians and that will be it for today. And then on to something else tomorrow. I don't even know what yet, but we'll figure it out. Or I'll figure it out. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, 1. Royal family of God, if a person is discovered in some sin, you who are spiritual, filled with the Holy Spirit, restore such a person in a mental attitude of grace. That's the important phrase of this whole uh, half of the verse. The mental attitude of grace is what restores the fellow believer. Not you telling them to restore themselves, not you being critical, but a mental attitude of grace. And a mental attitude of grace goes much further then a mental attitude of I'll control you, I will do this to you, I will do that to you, to make you adhere to what I want you to adhere to. Mental attitude of grace. It's something we all need and it's something we all must grow into, grow in grace and in knowledge. Grace first, knowledge second. Grow in grace and in knowledge. And we noted some of this yesterday, so I'll move on. Be careful yourselves so that you are not tempted to. In other words, consider yourself in that you sin too. When you see another fellow believer in a church sin or outside of church sin, it refers to all believers. When you see a believer sin, consider yourself you sin too. And consider yourself you must have a grace attitude. And consider yourself that you should not stick your nose into other people's business because you too are going to get involved in sin at some point. So be careful yourselves so that you are not tempted to, whether it be by the category of sins that the other people are committing or by a sin that uh, you like to commit. Just referring to the fact you must have a mental attitude of grace because we all sin. Now, in Galatians 6.2, in Galatians 6.2, it might seem weird to you since you understand the privacy of the priesthood. But in Galatians 6.2, we have to take it in context, and I'll explain it a little more today. Galatians 6.2, keep carrying one another's burdens, and at that point in time, fulfill the law of Christ. So we have cause and result here. And actually the cause is fulfill the law of Christ. It actually comes at the end of the sentence. If you are fulfilling the law of Christ, love your neighbor as yourself, you're carrying another's burden. And that's all it's referring to, and I can tell you that because we have to look at Scripture in context. These verses that we have in the Bible were never there before. Somebody added them so we could look it up easier. And I'm glad they did add it so we could look it up. But these verses separated amongst themselves have no meaning. It's all in context. And the context, well, look, well, you see you have Galatians 6, 2. And now let's look at Galatians 6, 5, which we'll go over in a moment. For each one will carry his own load. Now you would say to yourself, looking at Galatians 6, 2, and then looking over at Galatians 6, 5, you would say to yourself, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. You just haven't interpreted it correctly. The Bible never contradicts itself. So how do you carry another's burden? Well, by carrying your own load. And how do you carry your own load? By having impersonal love toward others. 
by fulfilling the law of Christ, as it says in Galatians 6 2. You fulfill the law of Christ, love your neighbor as yourself, impersonal love. And you say, well, how is that carrying someone else's load that I have impersonal love? Because when you have impersonal love, you have I love you. We've studied impersonal love before, but it's always important to repeat. I love you. And there's two different forms of this in the, actually many different forms in the Greek, but we'll study two different forms. When you say, I love you, sometimes it depends on the object, and that's personal love. When you say, I love you, maybe you're in love with someone in high school, some guy or some girl, and you say to that person, I love you. But you love them, why? On the basis of who and what they are. That's personal love. Nothing wrong with personal love. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's not impersonal love and that's what's commanded of all of us toward everyone, every believer. So let's say uh, the guy is tall. You like tall men. So if you're going to love a guy, first of all, your criteria is tall man. So as long as he's tall, you'll like him. And then uh, maybe your criteria is white teeth. And that's another one. And maybe your criteria is sense of humor. He's got to be funny. If he's, if he's handsome and not funny, well, he's no fun to be around, so he's got to be all these. And as long as the object holds up to your standards, you'll love that object. But as soon as that object gets mad and is no longer humorous, your love will diminish because it's dependent upon the object. Or if he gets in a car wreck and loses his legs, he's no longer tall, your love diminishes. Or uh, if he smokes a lot and his teeth get uh, yellow, diminished love. Or drinks a lot of coffee. Coffee's even worse than that. Drinks a lot of coffee, teeth get yellow. And therefore, love diminishes. Love is gone. Why? It's dependent upon the object. But then you have I love you, and this is a different love. This one's dependent upon you. It's not dependent upon the object. The object may be totally obnoxious. The object may be so obnoxious to you, you don't even want to be in their presence. But you still love them. Why? Because it's based on your integrity. So how do you bear someone else's burdens? You love them in spite of themselves. You love that person in spite of themselves. In spite of the fact that they're obnoxious. They're ugly to you. In spite of the fact you're in, or they may be in competition with you. You should be in competition with no one. But they, they may be in competition with you, and you still love them. And that's because it's based on your integrity and not theirs. So how do you carry another believer's burdens? You love them no matter what. And that's impersonal love. That's actually what it's referring to. And it's not referring to sticking your nose into somebody's business as so many people try to relate that to. So keep carrying one another's burdens and at that point of time fulfill the law of Christ. That is, you're carrying another's burdens, another believer's burdens, when you love them no matter what their flaws. You love them no matter what the mistakes they make. You still love them because it's based on your integrity. So you're carrying their burdens. Oh, they may not know how to act. They might fall all apart all the time. And they might be so bitter and vicious and everything else. But it doesn't change who you are. So the fact that they're not changing you, the fact that their attitude does not change your attitude, means that you are carrying their burdens. And every believer has a burden, so how should we act in church and everywhere else? When someone has a problem, when someone has sin, love them. Carry their burdens through impersonal love. Don't gossip, that's not impersonal love. Don't run them into the ground to make yourself feel better, that's not impersonal love. You're not carrying their burdens. So that's what it means to carry burdens. And you won't get that in any commentary because they don't know what they're saying. I'm sorry, but they just don't. 
I wish they did because uh, more of us would have an understanding of it, but I doubt it because there's a such thing as positive and negative volition. And a lot of these people that write commentaries really don't know anything. They're so far off it's almost disgusting. Now Galatians 6.3. And this is in context as well. The fact that we have to have impersonal love is because for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, that's arrogance. The three arrogant skills, self-justification, self-deception, self-absorption. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, and that's all of us, we're all nothing, he deceives himself. And that's arrogant skill number two. He deceives himself. Number two on the cogwheels of arrogance. And so why does the Apostle Paul talk about carrying one another's burdens, fulfilling the law of Christ, and then switch right over and talk about arrogant believers? Because it's the arrogant believers toward whom we must have impersonal love. We shouldn't get in bitter squabbles with them. We should simply have impersonal love toward them. And when you do that, you're carrying their burdens. And you're carrying your own. And your load is light, as we will note in a moment. So as Galatians 6.3 is noting, arrogance is the biggest problem in the spiritual life. And it's the biggest problem in relationships with people. And if you have problems in relationship to people, if you have problems in marriage if you have problems in family, if you have problems in the workforce, if you have problems in school, if you have problems with your friends, you're having problems with your spiritual life. If you don't know how to carry one another's burdens. You don't know how to have impersonal love. You don't have the spiritual fortitude to uh, simply uh, resist the temptation to get into a squabble. Some people love squabbles. I've watched Jerry Springer occasionally, and those people love to get in fights. It is their life. That is what they enjoy doing. It gives them an adrenaline rush, and that's their sedative. Or their speed, actually. It's their speed. And it's a, actually, it's almost like their drug. You think about the drug addiction, there are people addicted to strife, which is a worse addiction and harder to break because you can't see yourself in that light. A person who abuses drugs knows they have a problem. And if you ever watch that show Intervention or something like that on television, you see these people with all these horrible problems getting on heroin, getting on crack, and I feel for them because they're addicted. And, uh, and it's, it's hard for them to get off of it, almost impossible without a lot of help from doctors, etc. And uh, so it is a difficult problem, but we don't have any clinics for addiction to strife, do we? But we should. Guess what that clinic is? Church. It's right here. This is your clinic for addiction to strife, addiction to uh, getting involved in fights among believers and unbelievers do it. Go ahead and go to sleep. You don't have to hold your eyeballs open. I know you've just had your teeth out. You can get it later. So if anyone, so if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So that's arrogance. And that's the biggest problem in life. Because guess what? Every time you go into strife, you're right. And you know you're right. And you'll tell the world you're right. You've got to be right in order to run down someone else. That's the only way you can justify yourself. And you've got to deceive yourself and you've got to be self-absorbed and you've got to proclaim, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Well, in the issue at hand you may be, but as soon as you fall into strife, you're wrong. No matter how right you are, you're wrong. You can't do a right thing in a wrong way. And you can't do a wrong thing in a right way. You might be right in an issue. But you can't go about it in a wrong way. You might be right. I mean, somebody might attack you and you might be completely innocent. But it would be wrong to react. And you can't go about something that is right. And you might be right. And you know you're right. But you can't latch on to that. You must latch on to the filling of the Holy Spirit and say, I will not react 
I will carry that person's burden. How do you carry another person's burden? When they attack you, you do not react. Now, carrying another person's burden, it's kind of like this as I told you yesterday. Somebody attacks you. They have an initial attack against you. You haven't done anything wrong. They attack you. So what are they doing? They're throwing burdens upon you, their own burdens. And then what are you to do with your burdens? Cast your burdens upon the Lord, for He cares for you. So what do you do? You just throw it right up to the Supreme Court of Heaven. Don't react. Give it to God. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay, and He repays a lot better than we ever will. And God will repay a lot of people. If you've been done wrong, and you know you've been done wrong, leave it in God's hands, and God will smash that person to a pulp. God is fair and just. People may not be. I know people aren't. I know... <laughs> People can't always be fair and just. And you may feel as if you've been unjustly treated. You may have been. Leave it in the Lord's hands. He'll take care of it. And that goes for everybody in every relationship too. So leave it in the Lord's hands. He'll take care of it. And therefore, you're carrying the burden because they've lashed the burden upon you and then you just threw it into the Supreme Court of Heaven. Then God will deal with that person. You may never see God deal with that person. Sometimes you'll get a glimpse of it. You may never see God deal with that person, but that shouldn't concern you at all. Now Galatians 6.4 Let each one... Now here we go into a verse of privacy. We have a verse of privacy. Let each one... Now, before we had verses where you could say, well, that looks like I could get into someone else's life, that I could attack someone else's lifestyle, or that I could do this and that. That's not what it's saying at all. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear in these next verses. Let each one examine his own work. Examine yourselves. Don't examine others. Examine yourselves. Now, I've given you exceptions. We're talking about uh, people who do not have the spiritual gift or people not in authority. Examine yourselves. A pastor must examine his congregation. A boss must examine the people working under him. A, a parent must examine his children. Must. It w he, would be, he and she would be lacking in their duty if they didn't. And so there is authority related to it, but when it comes to... Uh, Likewise, people where there's no authority involved, let each one examine his own work. And this is divine good production through the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Examine your own work through the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is divine good production, not human uh, energy of the flesh. This is divine good work. Then he can take pride in himself. Cognitive self-confidence, spiritual self-esteem. You see, some people would come in here and say, that is the most arrogant pastor I have ever heard. He thinks he knows it all. Well, then he can take pride in himself. It's referring to spiritual self-esteem. And a pastor should know what he's talking about. Now, most don't, and that's why they get all upset. Oh, he thinks he knows everything. He should know a lot more than you if he's going to be a pastor. He should. If he doesn't, don't go there then he can take pride in himself and not compare himself with someone else. This is what the legalists would do. They would come in there and they would compare themselves with Paul and they weren't even close to the stature of the Apostle Paul. These people were so far behind the Apostle Paul that they got swept up in the fifth cycle of discipline. Yet they nitpicked at Paul and they came to the Galatians and said, well, Paul doesn't know this and that and they lied about Paul and they ran him into the ground. But Paul was the greatest Bible teacher ever, ever. But what they would do is they would come in and compare themselves with Paul and say, see, Paul didn't even charge for his messages because they weren't worth buying. But you're going to pay for mine because we're that good. And they had a lot of arrogance and they were in competition, constantly in competition. And any time anyone goes into legalism and anyone gets away from the spiritual life, they will go into competition and envy and jealousy. 
There is no place for competition in the Christian way of life. We're all on the same team. And there's no I in team. There is an I in win, which means you yourself must be a winner. There's not an I in team, meaning you don't make it an issue among other believers. And don't compete with among other believers. And don't try to compete with a spiritual gift. And don't try to compete to be the spiritual head of the mountain, etc. Just There's no use in it. It's fruitless. Absolutely fruitless. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. So what Paul is referring to in Galatians 6.4 is playing spiritual king of the mountain. And what Paul is saying is keep to yourself. Production is based on grace anyway, and you know how far you've gone. And if you glory in it, you're glorying in it with the Lord and you're not messing with anyone else, nor comparing yourself with anyone else. There is no comparison. There is no competition. There should not be. I know there is, but there should not be. This is the failure of Christianity today. Competition. Competition in the workplace. I don't mean just in church. Competition in the workplace. Believers should not be competing among other believers in the workplace. And uh, being in the South, most people you're going to work with are believers. They might be a little goofy, but they have believed in Christ. They might not know much doctrine, but many of them have believed in Christ. Don't get in competition with a fellow believer, not even in the workplace. If you're promoted, you're promoted by the Lord in any endeavor, whether it be in the workplace, in the workforce, whether it be in sports, in whatever endeavor you decide to go in life. The competition part of it, yes, do the best you can, but don't do it as unto men, do it as unto the Lord. And when you work as unto the Lord, you will be promoted. And when you push aside all the competition, you will be promoted. Oh, it might take time. You might stay in a lowly position for a long time. But maybe we'll go into Joseph. Because uh, Joseph was one who went from pit to pinnacle. And he stayed in a pit for years and years and years. Yet he was the greatest spiritual giant of his time. And he stayed in a pit. And then one time, he decided to use man to get ahead. And guess what God did? He said, nope, you can't use man to get ahead. That's two more years in prison for you. Until you learn this lesson, until you learn humility, you'll never get ahead in life. You must have humility, and that should be part of the study as well. Because so few people understand humility today. You have to be humble. There's no justification of not being humble. You have to recognize authority. And Joseph had to recognize authority. No matter how vicious that authority is, and that, that authority over Joseph was unfair. And the authority over Joseph was tyrannical. And the authority over Joseph was brutal. But so what? There's a time when you can say, well, it is unfair, it is brutal, but now I can lean on the Lord and the Lord will get me through it. And He'll pull me out of this situation. Instead of leaning on man, don't look at man to do it for you. He can't, but God can. And He'll pull you right. He'll take you from the pit and put you on the pinnacle. And that's what he did with Joseph. And Joseph had been unfairly treated and he did not complain except for that one time. And because of one time, one complaint, he had to stay there two more years. And then after that, he had learned his lesson and he came out of the pit. And in the blink of, the, of an eye, he was of the level of Pharaoh. He had the authority of Pharaoh. The real Pharaoh, he was just a figurehead from then on. He didn't really like to work anyway. So he said, all right, Joseph, you will be the king of Egypt, as it were, and I'm going to go over here and party with these ladies and drink a lot of booze. And that's exactly what he did. But uh, Joseph was given the responsibility because he could handle it. And he did handle it. And that was the most prosperous time for Egypt. And Joseph became the richest man in the world. Now that was part of his blessing. You might be unfairly treated. That doesn't mean you're going to become the richest man in the world. But you can grow in grace and in knowledge and become the richest man in the world in terms of spirituality. 
And that's where happiness is. So you've been unfairly treated, leave it in the Lord's hands. Now Galatians 6.5. For each one will carry his own load. Now the Greek word is phortion. P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. And this means a light weight. That's P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. For each one will carry his own load. And that Greek word means a light weight. What we carry in the spiritual life is light. Why? Because of grace. You see, there's, real no, there's no energy of the flesh in being filled with the Spirit. You can be a quadriplegic in a wheelchair and never do anything with your life except learn spirituality and become the greatest believer ever. And why is that? It's a light weight. It requires no physical energy. It requires no sweating. It requires nothing but your positive volition. So it's a light weight. And listening to the Word of God one hour a day is a light weight, as the Word of God says, a very light weight. Some of you may choose to listen more, and it's still a light weight. And sometimes you might be encouraged to listen all day long. You've had a hard day, and the only way you're going to deal with it is with doctrine, so you listen all day long. I've done that before. And that's a light weight because you're doing it because you want to do it. You're not forced into it. If you're forced into it, it's not a light weight because you'd rather work on the energy of the flesh. Now Galatians 6.6 6. Now the one habitually receiving teaching in the word concentrate on him that teaches in the sphere of all good things, good of intrinsic value. What this is saying is now that you're filled with the spirit, you must now use the second power option. This is where we have the two power options. Filling of the Holy Spirit the Apostle Paul's already described the filling of the Holy Spirit in Galatians. And now he is describing the second power option, Operation Z. And he's saying, concentrate. Now that you're filled with the Spirit, concentrate on him, on who? The pastor teacher, whoever it is teaching the Word. Now the one habitually receiving teaching in the Word, concentrate on him that teaches. Concentration is key to spiritual growth. If you can't concentrate, you won't grow. Or you may grow a little bit here and there. And you may need to learn how to concentrate. But when you're receiving the Word of God, you must concentrate. It's the most important thing in the world. You concentrate on television. We concentrate on movies. I sure do. In fact, in learning the Word of God, I've learned to concentrate better on everything. And if I were to go to college now, I would concentrate in a college course better now than I ever would have when I was younger. And that's because I've learned how to concentrate. And in fact, the Word of God, by your concentration, can increase your IQ by as much as 20%. Because the more you learn to concentrate, the higher your IQ becomes. And you can, it's not much, but you can, through concentration, actually increase your IQ by 20%. But you have to have concentration. And oftentimes we don't, and therefore God the Holy Spirit takes up the slack in that area. So you must habitually receive the Word of God and concentrate, meaning no unnecessary movement, nothing that would be disturbing or distracting to others who are serious students of the Word of God. Now I've noted when people move around, I haven't said much about it, but when people move around and hop from seat to seat and when they go outside and come back in, it's a distraction. It's a distraction for me and for others who are listening. And that's not concentration. And it's irritating, but I haven't said anything about it because this is your property and you can go in and out as you please since it is your property, but it's still irritating. It's irritating for me and for those who watch you hop around and uh, that's just a fact so you concentrate on him that is you concentrate on the pastor in the sphere of all good of intrinsic value in the sphere of all good of intrinsic value so if you do not habitually take in the word of God you are mocking God 
snubbing your nose at God. When you do not concentrate, you are snubbing your nose at God. You are then in danger of habitually practicing sin and losing your eternal rewards. And this is what 6 7 says. Now notice, 6 6 says, Concentrate. Galatians 6 6 says, Concentrate on him that teaches. Now immediately after 6.6 six, six, we have 6.7 six, and it is in context. What happens if you do not concentrate on the Word of God or if you do not care for the Word of God? Do not be deceived or stop being deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. You don't get away with uh, not concentrating on the Word and you don't get away with not wanting the Word. And that all has to do with positive volition. But if you're negative and you don't care for the Word, but obviously you do, you do or you wouldn't be here, but if you didn't care for it, well, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And you will receive more punishment from wrongdoing, which is lack of interest in the Word. You will receive more punishment for lack of concentration and lack of interest in the Word than you will for any sin. You're punished for sin. But what was it that David said God wanted you to have? Knowledge! And what is it that destroys a nation? Lack of knowledge, not sin. It doesn't say because of your preponderance of sin you're going under. It says because of your lack of knowledge. Everyone sins. It's a lack of knowledge. And God is more interested in your knowledge of the Word than He is in your sin. Why? Because your sins were taken care of at the cross. He took care of that already. Now it's up to you to take care of whether you know the Word or not. And you see, that's the the only thing you have control over. Your volition. Whether you want the Word or whether you don't want the Word. That's your choice. And since it's your choice, that's what God wants you to do. Learn the Word. Are you ever going to stop sinning? No. Your frequency of sin may lessen, and it will lessen, as you grow in grace. But as you're a spiritual child, you may sin 50, 60, 100, 1,000 times a day, and you better rebound every single time. God's already dealt with your sin. Now it's time to deal with your volition, and that's your choice. And God doesn't even manipulate your volition. He'll punish you if you go in the wrong direction, but He cannot manipulate your volition. He doesn't suddenly appear to you and say, Why are you here and not at church? That's because God's a gentleman, and He respects your volition. He'll punish you when you're wrong because you're His child, but even as a child, He respects your volition. As an adult child, He respects your volition. We noted that, adult children, huios. And then we had minor children, technon. And even as an adult child, he respects your volition. There's application of that, but I won't go into it. Galatians 6.8. Galatians 6.8 now. Because the person who habitually plants in the flesh will reap Corruption of the flesh, that is physical corruption. That is, you'll eventually die of the sin face to face with death. Because the person who habitually plants in the flesh will reap corruption of the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now this is not an eternal life passage in that you will lose your salvation if you're not filled with the Spirit. That's ridiculous. We've noted all about eternal security and here's this one verse that seems to contradict but it does not it does not contradict this eternal life is referring to the eternal life of eternal rewards it means that the rewards you receive have a life of their own and eternal one meaning if you execute this spiritual life through the filling of God the Holy Spirit you will reap eternal life in that the rewards you receive have eternal life Meaning, if you are maintain the filling of the Holy Spirit, you will reap rewards. Rewards is what it's referring to. It cannot refer to the eternal life that we all receive at salvation. Because we've noted all the passages related to that. And we should all believe that by now. 
You run across this passage and want to jump all over and say, well, this means I can lose my salvation because I'm not reaping from the Spirit. The only reason you have the Spirit is because you're saved. I mean, that would make no logical sense whatsoever. So you have to know doctrine and the technical theology to understand this passage in that if you maintain corruption of the flesh, that is, if you want to do as we studied in Proverbs chapter 6, if you want to remain under that gossip, maligning and judging and all the worst sins, murderings and uh, uh, corrupt and uh, strife and all those things, if you want to remain under that, you lose your eternal life rewards. That is, you lose the rewards that have eternal life. And those rewards, why does it say eternal life? Because those rewards are there even if you don't get them. And those rewards are going to be on deposit for eternity for you to look at. Now to some they will be deposited. To those who execute the spiritual life, these rewards will be deposited and they'll be on your head for eternity. To those who do not execute the spiritual life and you flounder around in the old sin nature and have a Jerry Springer type attitude, etc., these people will not receive their eternal rewards but it's going to be on deposit forever for them to look at and to understand that they failed. And if you're concerned about what people think now, wait till you get to heaven. And why be concerned about what people think? Why not be concerned about what your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thinks? Who cares what people think? It's temporary what people think. And if you grow in grace and in knowledge... You also grow in grace and stature among men as our Lord did. Meaning if you have grace orientation, more people will like you. If you look around yourself and you say to yourself, nobody likes me, take a look at your grace orientation. Now there's going to be points in people testing when nobody's going to like you. God's going to make it occur that way. And there's going to be people attacking you all the time. But if you are never liked, there's something wrong with you. And I've noted people like that. You know, I've even asked them the question, I wonder why nobody so likes you? Well, my dad's asked somebody this question. I wonder why nobody likes you? Well, I don't know. I don't have a clue. Well, we know why. But we're, I'm not going to gossip about this person. There's nobody here. But why don't people like... Well, maybe you're messing up somewhere. Maybe people don't like you because there's something wrong with you. Now again, there are tests. There's something called people tests when it seems like the whole world's against you. That does occur. But people test doesn't last your whole life. It lasts for a time period. And if you have grace orientation, you will make friendship very easily. You'll have friends at work. Oh sure, they'll gossip about you, but you won't care. And uh, you'll get along easily with people because why? RMA, relaxed mental attitude. If you don't have a relaxed mental attitude, people aren't going to want to hang around you. Why? Because they'll feel, eventually it'll rub off on them and they don't want to feel that bad. They don't want to feel as bad as those do. So if you can't get along with people, check yourself. Don't look at others and say they're wrong. Check yourself. And you may be completely right. And in that case, rebound and just keep it in the Lord's hands. Now 6.9 So we must not make it a habit of becoming mentally discouraged in beautiful noble doing. That is oftentimes it's very easy to get discouraged in learning the word and it's very easy to get discouraged in teaching the word. It goes both ways. And in fact it's part of the what do they call it? Vocational handicap or a vocational um, yeah vocational handicap of being a pastor getting discouraged very easily. So we must not make it a habit of becoming mentally discouraged in beautiful, noble doing. That is, in you growing in grace and in knowledge. Don't get discouraged from it just because you're attacked. For in God's time, we will weep if we do not give up. If we do not give up. Are you looking confused because I'm not saying the right thing? No, okay. For in God's time we will reap if we do not give up. 
And people give up easily. They get discouraged easily. They don't have the numbers they want in a church, so they get discouraged and they start going out for other things. Do not be discouraged. Stick with it. Do not become mentally discouraged in beautiful, noble doing. What is beautiful, noble doing? Learning the Word of God. That's beautiful and that's noble. Don't get discouraged in it. Just because it seems people don't listen to you, don't worry about it. So what? Do not become mentally discouraged. For in God's time we will reap. When is God's time? The Bema. Oh, we might not reap much now. As if pastor teacher might get up and teach doctrine and reap very little. But in God's time he'll reap a lot if he stuck with it and did not get discouraged problem with most pastors who even started out in doctrine got so discouraged with numbers and got so discouraged by the people who constantly attacked him that he went off the reservation and lost his crown. He let his congregation take his crown. Idiot. I don't plan to go that way. I say plan. I'm not going that way because I'm not discouraged. I don't care one way or the other because I know I'm doing a beautiful, noble doing. And I know in God's time I'll reap no matter what. So don't give up. Oftentimes you want to give up under testing. Do not give up under testing. Keep plugging. Keep pushing. Galatians 6.10 So then, as we have opportunity, let us keep administering divine good to all people. Now let's note this uh, first clause. So then, as we have opportunity. That means as you have opportunity, such as in witnessing. As you, has a, as you have an opportunity. You see, sometimes the opportunity will lend itself. Someone will start talking and it will lend itself an opportunity for you to witness. Don't do as the Jehovah Witnesses and go from door to door. They're trying to make their own opportunity for Satan's kingdom. You don't have to run door to door. And in fact, it's almost obnoxious to run door to door. It violates people's privacy and they might be busy and they might not want to talk to you. Who do you think you are walking onto somebody's property, knocking on their door to talk to them about something? You're on somebody's property. It might be their time off. They might have just worked themselves 16 hours in a day and here you are interrupting their beautiful sleep. Those people want to smack you before they listen to you. What in the world is that? That means don't do it that way. Don't thrust it on the people. Don't push doctrine on the people. Don't even push the gospel on the people. As you have opportunity, that's when you can have some divine production. And the funniest thing going on today is get everybody around so they can go out and uh, witness for 30, 50 times a day. The time, the, the how many times you witness is not the issue. The issue is the quality of it. And God will give you the opportunity to witness. Maybe you haven't witnessed in a year. Maybe God hasn't given you an opportunity to witness in a year. And let's say you witness to one person in a year and they believed. While these other people have ran around and made about a hundred people mad and turned them off. And the one person they tried to give the gospel to who may have been receptive, well, they didn't even give it to them clear enough. And then God the Holy Spirit will take up the slack in that case, of course. But what this means is as you have an opportunity, don't force the opportunity. Let the opportunity come to you. Don't force it. So as you have the opportunity, let us keep administering divine good to all people. And that means not by sticking your nose in their uh, business. This means by producing impersonal love toward all mankind. Oftentimes through your manner of life, someone will approach you and say, I've noticed how you've been working on this job and how I've been so upset and uh, you, you never seem to get upset. How do you do that? Then you have an opportunity to say, well, first of all, you've got to start off by believing in Christ. If you've already done that, hear these tapes or something else. Or guide them to a church that uh, teaches doctrine, one or the other. 
and especially to those who belong to the born-again family of faith. And that's referring to the fact that uh, we all have spiritual gifts. Some people have the spiritual gift of helps toward the royal family. And that's where you can produce divine good by going to a hospital and encouraging someone on a sick bed. And uh, you might encourage born-again believers from your spiritual gift. But don't stick your nose into their lives. Do it when you have the opportunity or when the opportunity arises. You might have the opportunity to reveal doctrine or to show somebody the way to doctrine. You might have the opportunity to say, hey, I know this guy is teaching the Word of God. If you want to come, you're free to come, and here you go. There it is. Well, that's divine good. But you do it when the opportunity arises. Maybe you'll be in conversation and they seem to be seeking something. So the opportunity has arisen where you can witness don't miss out on the opportunity because of a shame in this, as so many young people will do, ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They will not witness because they're ashamed that uh, maybe their friends will look down on them. Don't do that. We're dealing with people's souls, and if someone wants the gospel, don't miss out on the opportunity. By now, if you've been with me listening, you should know how to give the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And it's that simple. And people have been saved by that very simple phrase. Well, I thought we would get through all of uh, Galatians, but we won't. We'll end Galatians tomorrow and move on into something else. I'll figure it out tomorrow or tonight. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.